So continuing, um, we were uh, last, uh, sorry, I got cut off on my video, but uh, we were discussing the Harsberg Front. Uh, one of the issues we were discussing with the Harsberg Front is the notion that uh, Schroeder Bank is in the city of London and also in Hamburg. And the Schroeder family, where the Harsberg Front met, was actually at uh, Kurt Schroeder's private uh, estate. So with the Harsberg Front, we have this uh, city of London. And if you want to understand more about the conception of the city of London within English society, I would recommend looking up this uh, documentary that was recently made called The Spider's Web. which goes into the financial power of the city of London and how it relates to British uh, imperialism. Some other things that uh, we'll be looking at include um, uh, some other banks that were involved in the city of London and are also involved in Hamburg. So we have this City of London interest, Hamburg interest. What is going to happen is pretty soon, um, in 1933, after the Harsburg Front had met and decided on a plan to form a, a very, very um, just completely right-wing, nationalistic, and um, capitalistic government that is authoritarian to its core. In 1933, uh, the Reichstag fire happens, and this is when the Nazis come to power. Basically, what people believe has happened is a false flag operation by the Nazis was done against the communists, and they set up a communist to look like he was burning down the Reichstag, which is the parliament of Germany. Uh, after this, uh, like 9-11, they enacted uh, repress repressive measures which took down people's civil liberty liberties left and right and instituted basically the Nazi state, which was run by the SS. And all dissent was monitored by the SS and the Gestapo. The Gestapo is part of the SS. The Gestapo is the secret police, so to speak, of Nazi Germany who later in East Germany are replaced by communist secret police, and in the West by former Nazis like uh, Gellin. Uh, there was this General Gellin who was a, a Nazi uh, general serving in the East. He was an anti-communist and uh, eventually became the head of West German intelligence and worked with the CIA to fight communism, even though he was a Nazi general and was uh, responsible for torturing uh, many, many Russians and killing them. Um, after this, the Nazis were fully in power after this false flag operation. What they were able to do is put in their own government this way and preceding this, ironically, in the United States, in the United States, there's a coup attempt. So, this is never really taught in schools um, for obvious reasons. The American Legion, well, let's backtrack because it's not really the American Legion. The person mainly responsible for this, although there are many people, but we can look at one person who is largely responsible for trying to overthrow FDR and put in a fascist regime is J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is, I don't know if people know about J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is one of the richest men in America during his day. 
Uh, he's a Wall Street banker. He can pretty much uh, dictate to politicians and to anybody what he wants done. He was a financer of um, uh, Mussolini when the Italian fascists took became a took over control of the Italian government and became a fascist dictatorship. J.P. Morgan was the money behind that. And interestingly, another character associated with J.P. Morgan is Bill Donovan, who would, who would eventually uh, lead the OSS. He would eventually lead the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. But Bill Donovan... Uh, was working for J.P. Morgan. Bill Donovan was a Wall Street lawyer working for J.P. Morgan. And he went to Italy uh, working for J.P. Morgan and was able to um, basically get inside the Italian fascist military um, operations by telling Mussolini that he was a fascist. So in Italy, he told Mussolini he was a fascist, and he's working for J.P. Morgan, which supports a fascist overthrow of the FDR government and the New Deal, the Socialist New Deal. So we see that um, these coup attempts are all part of um, what I believe is really the main goal, which was to take over the United States, because it has more resources, more financial power than anything else. But a lot of people don't know that this existed. The only reason we know this coup attempt existed, which was being promoted through a group called the American Legion. Everybody familiar with the American Legion? The American Legion, uh, when it was first founded, was supposed to be the counterpart to um, military organizations such as the Black Reichswehr. Uh, in France, there are fascist veterans organizations. In England, there are fascist veterans organizations. Um, in America, the American Legion was supposed to be the uh, American equivalent to these European fascist military veterans organizations. A uh, general, an American general of the United States Marine Corps named uh, General Smedley Butler, uh, the coup, the coup plotters, working on the interests of Wall Street banking, uh, were organizing through the American Legion. J.P. Morgan established the American Legion in Paris. Uh, the American Legion originally, like I said, was fascist, and they approached this very uh, popular general, this Marine general, Smith and Butler, to lead the coup, lead this military organization to overthrow the FDR government. And so we see, uh, so, so far we've run into coups in Germany, we've run into coups in Italy, and we've run into coups in the United States. At this time in England, they didn't really need to have a coup because the gov there was a large sympathetic, uh, there were a large number of sympathetic politicians, uh, lords, um, people with power in British society, who um, were siding with with Hitler, and this is where we get the whole thing about appeasement from the appeasement camp in English society that did not want to go to war with Germany was basically fascist sympathizers. One of the, we can point to how imperialism and uh, sympathies with fascism in British society are directly tied. If you look at Lord Londonderry, if you don't know anything about Northern Ireland, there's a town there called, that the Irish, I myself am Irish, I would call it Derry, that the uh, British call Londonderry. And Lord Londonderry is the uh, Lord of this town in Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland is start in, at that time and still is, as of this recording, still part of the United Kingdom. So in British society, there is no, you know, going to war against Germany is definitely not, uh, even in American society right at that time, it's definitely not on the board, so to speak. It is only after Churchill uh, wins 
the, the becomes prime minister, that they're definitely going to fight Germany. Up until that time, there was a large amount of sympathizers with Nazi Germany in British society. And, and you, we will see this throughout uh, my lectures here on this issue. We will see how fascism is not just in Germany. It was never just in Germany. Um, it's, in, it's in the United Kingdom and it's in America. And where it is, its origins is always amongst the elites, always amongst these city of London types, these financial powers. So, we all know how the war went. Uh, eventually, Nazi Germany would be defeated. Uh, the Allies would be victorious. Germany would become segmented into different occupation zones with the Soviets in the east and that area becoming eventually East Germany. Um, the British took over a sector. They took over, of course, the British were in charge of Hamburg. The British sector was in Hamburg. Um, the Americans were in the south. Even today we have all our bases in the south of Germany. Um, I forget where the French were, but... Um, after the war, I mean, it became very apparent to the Nazi leadership during the war, in the, around, 19, uh, around 1943, that they were not going to win the war. And they started planning, just like after World War I, the Reichswehr decided to plan the Third Reich. As they, it became apparent they were losing World War II, they started to plan the Fourth Reich. Now, the Fourth Reich is not actually going to be led by Hitler. There's a lot of talk um, lately about uh, Hitler surviving going to South America. Um, once we understand that Hitler is just a minor puppet and really just like somebody who gives speeches for the powers that be, um, we can see if Hitler did survive, him going to South America is literally him being pushed aside and set into retirement by Heinrich Himmler. Now Heinrich Himmler supposedly died. He supposedly killed himself after formulating all these plans to build the Fourth Reich and continue fighting. Uh, but apparently he just gave up and committed suicide, according to the British authorities. When he died in a British um, camp uh, from poisoning, uh, the Russians requested to see the body of Heinrich Himmler to confirm it was Himmler. The, the British did not allow that. Um, all we know to confirm Heinrich Himmler's death in this camp run by the British in the British sector near Hamburg is uh, their word for it. Um, there was a book written by a British historian um, called SS1, The Unlikely Death of Heinrich Himmler. Uh, I recommend reading that uh, to get further details. But in 2011, some, I don't know, what is that, 70 years after the war or something, um, the British government released top secret um, reports by military intelligence, 5th Division and 6th Division, secret intelligence services of the United Kingdom government. In 2011, they released these reports that were compiled during the war in 1943, 1945. For 1945. Um, and in these reports, it, it details what Himmler's plan was to build up a Fourth Reich. Some of these uh, elements that um, uh, Himmler had, had instructed the SS to follow upon defeat um, so it was uh, pure, uh, it was to be purely covert. There was never ever to be any overt mention 
that their organizations were anti-Semitic or fascist. They were supposed to appear as more like civic groups. Um, one of the things he wanted to do was infiltrate German industries or German corporations with the SS and thereby having businesses as the fronts and businesses as sort of um, his state would be businesses and they would run their research and their operations through these businesses as detailed in these uh, declassified top secret reports from the United Kingdom uh, military intelligence. Um, so what we look at, if we understand that, then we can start to understand the origins of corporate fascism. Now, if they're going to use corporations as the new Nazi state, um, it's going to take money. So what they do is they're going to, uh, Himmler came up with a plan to move their finances, uh, Nazi gold too, uh, was moved to um, fascist Spain. Fascist Spain, another, another fascist dictatorship funded by financed by the city of London interests. In this case, uh, a banking family related to a person named Mallet, M-A-L-L-E-T, who we will uh, speak about here in a second in relation to the Fourth Reich. Um, I forget what I was saying. Anyway, they're gonna take over these businesses, uh, infiltrate uh, German businesses. They're going to um, set up like a three, they believe in a three layered um, structure for organizing the uh, Fourth Reich, which is all covert. Now in these three levels, which is very similar to like a Masonic lodge structure, you have a three, le three levels, um, lodge, this lodge structure, this Masonic lodge structure is found throughout Europe. Uh, it's, but interesting, the lodge structure is predominantly found in the United Kingdom. It's just like all over the place. One example of how secret societies and lodge structures work, say in Northern Ireland, in the conflict between the Irish Catholics, of which I am, and the uh, British Protestants who were brought to Northern Ireland to displace the Irish Catholics. During this, during the war, during the troubles of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, up till uh, 1999 or so, 1998, uh, although there are still so, some small incidents of violence by dissident groups of, on each side, um, Gusty Spence was the person who created the Ulster Defense Association, which was a British Protestant, uh, patriotic, you know, unionist, Go Britain, very right-wing organization. He was initiated into this organization secretly. It was a secret society that ran the Alter Defense Association. So covert lodge structures are common throughout the intelligence world and throughout military intelligence operations. What this allows people to do is maintain a sort of secrecy at the top and at the mid-level to a degree while the, the basic bottom layer is doing all the public work. And they look like generally good Samaritans in this case. So what he has a high level, a mid level, and a ground level. At the high level, they're Nazis. They may not tell the mid-level that they're Nazis, and they're not going to tell the ground level what they are, really are. They absolutely forbade for there to be any connection to Nazism when they were creating these organizations. Um, and this is how they do it. 
they, they formulated a three level structure so that you can manage these things. At the high level, uh, the eyes of Nazi leadership that knows what's going on. At the mid-level, maybe some Nazis, they may not, they may know some things, but they're not gonna know all the things. And they're responsible for uh, for handling and operating the, the base level, which does all the public work. And they look like a, a civic group or a political party, uh, like a, a conservative political party in, in this case. And you will find like after the war, um, this physicist, for example, Pasquale Jordan was a committed um, a committed Nazi, but you see many Nazis becoming uh, Christian Democratic politicians after the war, and that might be an example of this uh, not disclosing that you're really Nazis and using other organizations to achieve your ends. One of the things they also wanted to do was create a civil war, and the creation of civil wars by fascist organizations is a common theme that you will find throughout fascist organizing history. Specifically, they wanted a civil war in uh, France. This civil war was supposed to bring about a new Nazi regime, but uh, based in the next state over in France. Uh, it's important to remember that the French government during the occupation was a Nazi government, that there were literally hundreds of thousands of Nazi sympathizers in France. This would not have been a hard thing to do. This civil war is, um, the civil war tactic is uh, very, um, something very important to watch. Indeed, in the United Kingdom, the, the entire reason for fomenting the destruction, the hatred between Irish Catholics in Northern Ireland and also Protestants in Northern Ireland was to create by these fascists in within British society to create a civil war in the United Kingdom in the early 1970s was when they were looking at this. And indeed, uh, Prime Minister Harold Wilson claimed that he was be, trying to be overthrown by these people. They were trying to create a civil war in the United Kingdom to seize power. And we see this again and again throughout fascist organizing. They will create division to seize power. So, um, one, another thing to look at with uh, the Fourth Reich development is the world of finance, too, which is also going to be centered in Hamburg, or back in Hamburg again. Actually, uh, historians have noticed that Hamburg is like a nexus for post-war um, Nazi organizing, like there's, everybody is like in and around the Hamburg area, which is in northern Germany, uh, along the sea. Um, it used to be part of what was known as the Hanseatic um, guilds, which were trading guilds before there were states. So this cultural maim of trading uh, Germans in, in Hamburg specifically is very, very important. These financial powers get centered there and in the city of London for reasons. Uh, but what Himmler had specifically set out to do was take over uh, Deutsche Bank. Um, and he sent um, uh, this person named Herman Abs. who was a banking official for the Nazis uh, after the war, he went in and he would infiltrate um, Deutsche Bank, run Deutsche Bank's operations in Hamburg. Um, you see this also, there's another um, intelligence officer that served with Himmler, but was not part of the SS. He was part of uh, uh, Kurt Jenke's private intelligence organization that worked with the SS, but was technically not part of the SS until later. Um, actually, Kurt Jenke was considered uh, second in charge behind Schellenberger of SS intelligence, even though he was not a member of the SS. But uh, Herman Obst was in the, the banks, and one of the, these uh, agents 
with Kurt Jenkins' J Bureau, that's what the intelligence agency was called, J Bureau's intelligence agency sent a Dr. Marcuse to England to negotiate uh, with the English at the end of the war. But eventually he, again, having gone to Britain to reach out to the British government or and or fascists, we're not sure on this account which he was really trying to get to, he is appointed a mayor in the British sector and he um, begins infiltrating the banking sector. And he writes about how he, later in life that he was trying to infiltrate the banking sector. And he was also trying to find everybody that was trying to create a Fourth Reich in that area. And you can see him like going around trying to find these people. J Bureau itself um, has one of Kurt Schroeder's uh, cousins working for it. So it's directly connected to the Schroeder family, directly, directly connected to this banking family in the which operates out in the city of London and Hamburg. So that's post-war, that's their idea of creating a Fourth Reich. But there's more to a Fourth Reich than that. Now we get into what is known as the Black the Black International. Now, oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to go over one more thing with the Fourth Reich before we get into this Black International. Sweden. What is Sweden's role in the Fourth Reich? Okay, so in 1943, when, when Himmler realized that they're gonna lose the war and he started creating these uh, Fourth Reich plans, um, if you don't know, Sweden during the war is officially neutral, but they are heavily, heavily sympathetic to fascism. They have a large fascist um, political party there. Like I said, members of the royal family are members of the fascist political party. Um, and interestingly, some of these leaders, um, their intelligence leaders are also fascist and sympathetic to fascism, but they are also um, descended from Scottish royals. So they have a connection to the United Kingdom already through blood and relations because all the royals are related. Um, 